Hey gang, welcome back to the channel. If you are a part of the IFD program, then welcome back. We're glad to see you. Um, and if you're new, um, then what we're doing right now, Maggie and I are teaching what's called an application session. This is where we go over some of the high yield topics um, from a previous week's chapter and show how they're not only, um, not only what the sciences are, but also how to apply them. And so this week we're gonna be looking at electrolytic cells or, and galvanic cells. Um, E is equal to HF, velocity is equal to lambda nu, and the Doppler effect. So let's get right to it. You want me to cover this, John, or you? <laughs> yeah, you can take it. Okay. Um, so galvanic cells, you know, they're a type of um, electrochemical cell. There's three types of electrochemical cells. You got galvanic, which is kind of like your baseline. Think of it as, you know, home base for electrochemical cells. Then you got electrolytic and concentration. But let's talk about galvanic cells first. They're also called voltaic cells. And this is my actual definition from my Anki card. Um, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a paraphrased way of thinking about galvanic cells. The whole point of these electrochemical cells is to convert chemical energy into electrical energy. And the way that you do that is by using those redox reactions. Redox is a super high yield material in chemistry. So you use differences in reduction potentials between your two metals. That's your chemical energy converted to electrical energy. Here's kind of a picture of a setup of a galvanic cell. So you have, you know, this is a very common one where you have zinc on one side and copper on the other. You can see that, um, let me just get my annotate tool out. You know, you have, this is literally like a solid brick of zinc, solid. And then this is um, a solid brick of copper. These two have different reduction potentials as you can see through their half reactions that are listed below. Um, one of them's flipped to show that it's being oxidized. So what happens here is basically, um, you know, there's solution filled with, uh, this, the, basically the same element, but in the ion form. So you got the um, ion for zinc and the ion for copper kind of surrounding these um, solid probes. And then you have a salt bridge to make sure that um, the aqueous solutions don't get too positive or negative to continue the current. Um, I'm not even going to be able to go into like an entire description of what these electrochemical cells are because there's a Khan Academy video that will do it way better. But I want you guys to know um, a little bit about galvanic cells, electrolytic cells, and concentration cells in relation to the MCAT. And so basically you're using the differences in reduction potential between two metals um, to convert to electrical energy measured by a voltmeter. Um, and you have a salt bridge to make sure that this reaction can continue to go know some some key words here anode cathode reduction always occurs at the cathode oxidation always occurs at the anode know that don't think about the cathode and anode as positive and negative because when we switch to electrolytic cells the signs are going to change but what doesn't ever change is that reduction is always at the cathode oxidation is always at the anode all right Anything else to say about that before I go on and talk a little bit about the differences with electrolytic cells, John? No, I think you nailed it. Uh, just make, and, and I know you're going to touch on this, but uh, where she put voltmeter, that's about to change. And that's something that, as far as the MCAT goes, they will change just that little, um, you know, they might put a voltmeter. I've seen them put a light bulb where they might just do the, the actual um, physics de uh, designation for a battery. Uh, and, and that will be your biggest clue as to whether you're dealing with a galvanic cell or an electrolytic cell. Yeah, exactly. As far as um, a galvanic cell goes, and I think, I think it's this one with all electrochemical cells, but I know galvanic cells, the electric potential is always positive. Okay, let me clear off this annotation. We can move on to electrolytic cells. Um, so I, one thing I want to say about galvanic cells is that the reaction that occurs here, this redox reaction, is spontaneous. And so it's, it's going to happen where 
whichever one has a higher reduction potential is the one that gets reduced. Um, and the one that has, the oxid, you know, the lower is the one that gets oxidized. Whereas with a electrolytic cell, it's kind of reversed. So whichever one has the higher um, reduction potential is um, actually going to be the one that gets oxidized, which is counterintuitive. But the way that we do this is by applying an external voltage. So, oops. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Wrong direction. <laughs> so an electrolytic cell is exactly the same as a galvanic cell, except you apply an external voltage to make the reaction kind of run in reverse to where the anode, the one that's getting oxidized is the one with the higher reduction potential. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this voltmeter and about the um, electric potential. You guys know how to calculate that by now as, as in a redox reaction, but the electric potential is gonna have a certain number. Just know that the voltage, the external voltage that's applied, is gonna have to be higher than that in order to overcome the spontaneous reaction and, and kind of go in the opposite direction. So the cell potential, um, here we go, the cell potential will always be negative. Um, but the sum of the applied voltage and the cell potential must be positive. So that's why I said don't focus on uh, cathodes being positive and anodes being negative, because in this case, the cathode is negative and the anode is positive. But the cathode is always the one that's being reduced and the anode is being oxidized. So think external voltage applied, electrolytic cell. Anything else, John? No, I think you're doing a good job. Um, it, it, it's, it's important to think uh, about the actual reactions, right? Because the way that you're going to see it on the MCAT is they may give you a galvanic cell and then ask you to calculate the overall cell potential. Um, and so, Maggie, would you go back one slide to the galvanic cell? Please don't ever make me go back again. We're going to get to the end of it. <laughs> Just kidding. So <clears throat> what, what you'll what you would expect to see if you're looking at a reaction like this is you'll have to actually write the reaction out. And so um, here they, they've got it written for you. They've, they've got the oxidation and the reduction reactions written out for you appropriately. But generally what you would end up seeing is that they would only write the reduction reactions for you. So if you see at the bottom right hand side, the oxidation half reaction for zinc. Normally, they would have that written out as zinc two plus plus two electrons goes to solid zinc. And the cell potential for that would be negative 0.76 volts. And so whenever you were writing, whenever you, the way to get the question right, so what, what's expected of you is to recognize, oh, well, in this specific situation, um, copper is actually going to be the one that's getting reduced. It's going to have a higher reduction potential than um, zinc here. And so you would write out the reaction as um, copper 2 plus plus solid zinc goes to copper solid plus zinc 2 plus. And then you would have to switch the signs of the zinc because you switched the direction of the reaction to actually solve for the overall cell potential. Yeah. Oil rig, guys, it's your friend. Oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. All right. A concentration cell is an interesting um, circumstance. So normally, um, you know, with, with the other two electrochemical cells, you have different species of metals or whatever you're working with um, being submerged in those solutions. But in, in a concentration cell, it's pretty much a galvanic cell. Like I said, galvanic is home base. Um, but the cathode and, and the anode are the same species. They're just at different concentrations. So typically when we work with electrochemical cells, we're talking about, um, you know, standard conditions, which is under a certain concentration, temperature and pressure. Um, but in a concentration cell, you actually have to do a little bit more math. Um, and they probably won't require you to do that math on the MCAP, but, um, Basically, that's what's going to cause. Ooh, hold on. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's what's going to cause the electrons to move. 
um, across that line to cause a reduction in one and a and an oxidation in the other. Concentration cells are by far the um, least tested. I would. I've say. never seen I've, them on the test. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen them either. Um, galvanic cells and electrolytic cells are more high yield. Yeah, they'll probably be on your test. Um, they're at least on every other test, but they're usually on every test. But we just threw concentration cells in there because it's incomplete to teach galvanic and electrolytic if you don't teach concentration cells. So yeah. um, <clears throat> probably what's a really good idea is for you to create a summary chart of these. Uh, and, and within the summary chart would be things like galvanic cells are, are driven by, um, so galvanic would be reduction potentials, electrolytic would be external voltage, concentration cells would be difference in concentrations. Um, which, which, what charge is the um, anode? What charge is the cathode? Where does, where does the um, species get reduced and oxidized? Th those are really, really good things to, to know for the galvanic and the electrolytic cell. And sometimes putting them in a chart will, will make it a lot easier to digest. Yeah, I agree with that. So I think I got a couple questions here. Uh, John, you want to do it or I can take it? Oh, more. gosh. Yeah, I'll try it. <clears throat> we may we may see how good of a tutor you really are. Um, researchers recently reported the design of a glucose slash oxygen galvanic cell. A description of the cell is provided below. It may be helpful to draw out the cell. Essentially, the researchers used enzymes naturally found in the body to facilitate the oxidation and reduction reactions. Is this first clip from the passage? Mm hmm. OK. Researchers use these enzymes naturally found in the body to facilitate the redox reactions involving glucose and oxygen, respectively, the two separate half cells of the galvanic cell. Because only one enzyme was used in the oxidation of glucose, the oxidation of glucose was not complete. No CO2 was provided, was produced. Which of the following designations for the oxidation and reduction half cell is correct? Okay. So this is pretty much just asking you to have that chart down pat that I mentioned earlier. So you've got to note that this is a galvanic cell. And then you're pretty much just saying, uh, well, I guess there's two questions. One of them is which of these would get oxidized and which would get reduced. Um, and then the second one is where does oxidation and reduction occur? So, I'm thinking red cat and anox right now, and I hope that's right. <laughs> um, is that right, Maggie? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. So red cat means um, reduction happens at the cathode and anox means oxidation happens at the anode. Um, that's a mnemonic that obviously just saved my life. And <laughs> I would imagine that oxygen would be the one to get reduced because it's oxygen. It would be hard to oxidize oxygen. And so, um, let's see, I want oxygen reduced. So that's either A or B and then reduction of the cathode. So I'll go with answer choice A. Yeah, and answer choice A is totally right. Um, there was a couple of clues in the passage, you know, we were told it's a galvanic cell. Um, and then we're told down there that, you know, blah, 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 enzyme used in the oxidation of glucose. But you could also think a little bit about cellular respiration and think about how oxygen is like the ultimate electron acceptor. So it's the ultimate like re reduced or oxidizing species, I guess. Um, it's the ultimate, like it's going to get reduced in whatever reaction. So um, and just like John said, red cat reduction happens at the cathode and oxidation at the anode. You have me nervous. I was sweating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I just throw these on John. Yeah, I was like, crap, this is my least favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. I just knew you could do it. Um, but, you know, there's a coffee house in Birmingham called Red Cat. And oh, yeah. We I'm going to make that joke. Yeah, I'm going to make that joke next time I go there. Um, all right, Doppler effect. John, would you like to explain this, Mr. Resident Physics Man? 
Yes. So, have you ever been um, outside at an ice cream truck or chasing an ice cream truck and it like goes past you and the sound changes? Maybe it's a little bit more obvious with the ambulance, right? Because we always think of the ambulance as, you know, it's coming towards us and it's really high pitched. It's like, Wee! and then it goes past us and it's like, Woo! <laughs> and that's actually the Doppler effect. So the idea, the, the noise, what makes it a higher or a lower pitch is actually um, the frequency of the wave, right? The, so the whee is a higher pitch and the woo is a lower pitch. And so that's what we perceive. So when it sounds higher or when it sounds like it's higher, then that's a faster frequency. And when it sounds like it's lower, then that's a slower frequency. Now, if the ambulance were standing still, it would just be one pitch, which is kind of weird. You know, a lot of people think that ambulances go wee woo wee woo, but they don't. They just make one solid pitch. It's it's very annoying. But um, the reason, and this is really cool actually, the reason that you experience that Doppler effect is because whenever the ambulance is coming to you the frequency or, or the wave not only gets its um, velocity and its frequency from the actual emission of the sound wave, but that frequency is faster because it gets the momentum of being released from a moving siren. And same thing when it's going away from us, um, the frequency that's hitting our ears is going to be a little bit slower because if you release that first sound wave at time point one well you're literally moving away from me so by the time you release your next sound wave because that's what that's what sound is right we're just pressurizing air by the time you release that next wave you're literally farther away from me and so that's forcing the um that's forcing the sound waves to have a larger wavelength um, which is going to end up being a smaller frequency. So that's the Doppler effect. Um, unfortunately, that's not enough to get questions right on the MCAT. <laughs> they, they, I, I actually will say I have, they, they, they will ask questions conceptually about the Doppler effect. Um, I think I saw one when I was taking the test and I was just like, like I got this, <laughs> and, but maybe that's a practice test. But still, main, usually you're going to want to focus on some of the, the math and the manipulations here. And so whenever um, looking at this first formula, it says the change in frequency divided by um, your standing frequency is equal to the velocity of the moving vehicle divided by the um, speed of sound. Yeah. Um, C is usually speed of light. So note here, what you're probably going to want to establish is looking at this figure that the stationary source, um, or, or the stationary person probably needs to be the observer. Otherwise you won't experience the Doppler effect. If you're just walking away from something, you're going too slow. You wouldn't experience that shift in frequency. But if there was a car driving by you that was blaring the radio, you would experience that. Yeah. Um, another instance would be like if you were if you were driving in a car and you have your windows down, you go by somewhere that's playing, um, you know, a certain pitch, then you would actually be the moving source, and so you would experience the Doppler effect of a stationary sound simply because you're getting closer to those emitted sound waves and so the frequency will be increased as you're in, as you're coming towards it and then the opposite you'd be going away from the source and so those frequency will be decreased um, when you're going away i will say john i actually i agree with you entirely i think that the doppler effect is usually tested conceptually you know the, the mcat likes to bring it back to medicine and we have a an, an diagnostic test it's the doppler ultrasound um, that can you know um, help us 
see like the things that have to do with our circulate circulatory system. So like blood flow and, um, you know, when there's clots or things that are slowing down blood flow. Um, so I see the Doppler effect tested most, mostly like that, although it's not bad to know the formulas either. Yeah. They'll, they'll usually bring up ultrasound because it uses sound waves and they'll say, what's the difference between, or, or they'll kind of describe the different uses of normal ultrasound, which is looking at stagnant images versus Doppler ultrasound, which is looking at moving fluids. You know, how, like Maggie said, how the heart's pumping fluid through the vessels or, or maybe even, I don't think, I don't think they, they may use it for like GI drainage. I don't know. But that's what they'll use it for. And then they'll say, what is the Doppler effect? So they'll give you yeah. something kind of medicine-y and it, you'll get your hopes up. You're like, this is going to be sweet. And then they'll be like, physics. <laughs> <laughs> but this can also yeah. happen with um, light as well. And I've seen, I've seen questions. Um, you, you'll, you'll normally see it called a red shift or a blue shift though. And that's just because if you if if something's traveling away from you let me get this right if it's traveling away from you then the wavelength is going to be longer so that's a red shift because you're approaching 700 nanometers right yeah i would think so and then if something's traveling towards you then that's a blue shift you'll have to check me on that um i think i think we learned that in astrophysics i know we learned it but i don't think i've forgotten it but um, I think I learned this in astrophysics. Well, it was like introduction to introduction on <laughs> astrophysics. I'm not, I'm not that cool. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I, and I actually have seen that brought up on the MCAT and they didn't test you on the physics. They, they didn't ask you to become Einstein. They just, ex they literally explained it, um, saying that a redshift or a blue shift was indicative of, a Dopp of the Doppler effect. And then they went ahead and asked questions about the Doppler effect, which is just this idea that if you have a um, moving source or a moving observer that you experience a <clears throat> shift in the frequency, that's not due to a frequency change at the point of emission, but it's due to like this external velocity. Yeah. I think I have a question on the Doppler effect. And I'll, I'll take it, I reckon, because I made you take that other one. Um, a hospital uses metastable radioactive technetium-99 for the nuclear... Tech-9. That would be tech-9 if he went to college. <laughs> um, of a patient's heart after do Doppler ultrasound, I can't see because his bar is in the way. After Doppler ultrasound indicates that a lesion constricts the vein, leading into the left ventricle. So kind of like we said, talking about medicine and circulatory system. The question asks, the advantage of the Doppler ultrasound technique over the standard ultrasound technique, John's like brushing his shoulders off because he literally- I am. Has... This is like the second time I've done this and I don't even look at these before we start. <laughs> he does not. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's comparing the two. Um, so the advantage of the Doppler is that it also allows A, distinguishing between fluids and tissue, B, measuring the blood flow, C, measuring the tissue density, and D, measuring the heart wall thickness. So I'm not a doctor. I haven't gone to medical school, and I know nothing about ultrasound because it's not a tested MCAT topic. So I don't really know if ultrasound tests anything. All I know is Doppler is equal to motion. Like that is kind of what I stick to. And so I am going to answer B here because I know that it told me that we're talking about Doppler ultrasound showing lesions constricting veins leading into a left ventricle. I know we can see blood flow um, via Doppler ultrasound. And so I'm going to say B. And I know the answer is B because I made this PowerPoint. Yeah, I really like the way you did that though, because I... I, I would have went about it differently. I would have thought about like ultrasound and stuff like that. But I like how you um, you did what I do in the in the psych soch section, right? Like, <laughs> like Maggie Maggie's like a psych soch queen. She's great at it, and and she knows all she knows like all the terms. And I'm just like emotions, <laughs> and I just pick like the most emotional one, and it just ends up being right. But I, I love the way you did that. That really simplified it. And that's the MCAT. Like, you don't have to know everything. 
you don't have to you don't have to have done ultrasound technician research whatever cure cancer like you just need to be like uh doppler is motion that's that's doppler mm -hmm. which of these is motion b yeah agree um and that's i mean you're never going to know everything that's on the mcat it doesn't matter if you measured in all 15 of the subjects that are tested like physics and biology organic general it doesn't matter um you could you could do everything and still wouldn't know everything on the mcat so definitely being able to pick up on uh key terms that's why we do these high yield topics because if you can get most of the high yield stuff like you're you're better off than someone who focuses on all the little things and how an ultrasound runs when it's not going to be tested. All right. Um, let's do this next thing. Yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about this. So um, there's a there's a thing called the photoelectric effect, and it's actually not what's what's tested in this part of our content. You know, we're we're kind of catering to the IFD students. And so um, the photoelectric effect has to do with this equation that I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to talk about this equation in a different setting. Um, my cat is like, she's trying out. to get out. She's like, she I is. hate this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> let, me let her out for a second. John. Yeah, I got you. So here, what we're talking about is the energy of a photon. Um, the photon is going to be a like discrete packet of energy. You, you, we, we all think of it with light. Um, and Maggie was explaining it in terms of the photoelectric effect because that's the idea um, that we can blast a we can blast a nucleus with energy and it'll knock one of the electrons out and we can measure the energy that uh, it knocked out by its velocity and stuff. Um, but <clears throat> typically whenever you see, uh this tested on the mcat you really just gotta bust out some like basic algebra the i love these questions because you just need to know that e stands for the energy of a photon or pretty much any electromagnetic wave h is planck's constant and maggie i don't know what your opinion is i mean i kind of do because i tutored you but i say memorize it you say memorize it I say, I say it's always given. I say it's always given. <laughs> I, I see. I, I think I can't remember if somebody told me that they got it where it wasn't given or or not. But I would just I I would hate myself if I missed a question because I didn't remember six point two times ten to the negative thirty fourth. Whenever I remembered, can I ask Sweet Susie for my oranges um, for the <laughs> citric <Not> acid cycle? <laughs> so. H is Planck's constant, memorize that, and F is just the frequency of the wave. And so generally, they're, they're pretty much going to give you um, E and ask for F, or F and ask for E, or a lot of times they'll give you like velocity and wavelength um, and ask for E. And because of a slide that's coming up a little bit later, the relationship between frequency, speed of light, and wavelength, you can always solve for E off of that. Yeah, um, I, a little caveat here conceptually and some things that will speed up some of your decision making. Um, to know that E equals HF is to know that energy of a photon is proportional to frequency. As the frequency increases, there's more energy in the wave. That's why, I mean, look at our, look at our spectrum here that I've given. Um, we're, John talked about it a little bit. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the relationship between wavelength and frequency. You see down here where it says x-rays, gamma rays, these are the things that cause cancer. These are the things that damage our cells because they have a super high amount of energy. All right. Why? Because they have a super high frequency. <clears throat> And, they, and um, we'll talk in, in like one slide here, how, how you can tell that they have a high frequency based on their wavelength. All right, so let me just stop teasing everybody and we'll talk about, come on, speed of an electromagnetic wave. There we go. So um, maybe I can actually talk about it without my cat like trying to rip down the house. Um, so you said this was lambda, John? 
Yeah. Okay. So lambda is this little upside down Y and it means wavelength. Um, so here is the equation for the speed of an electromagnetic wave. This is an equation that is very high yield. It's on every MCAT at least once, probably more than once. And they will, I mean, it's a simple question too. It's straight plug and chug, right? They'll give you frequency and they'll give you speed and you got to get wavelength. Or they'll give you wavelength and they'll give you frequency and you got to get speed. Um, or like John said, they'll give you frequency and wavelength and they'll ask for, or, oops, hold on. They'll give you, um, you know, velocity and wavelength and ask for energy because you can get frequency from it. So um, another conceptual thing to get here is that frequency is indirectly proportional to wavelength. So I was talking about how high the energy is in a gamma ray and how high the frequency is in a gamma ray. That's because it has a very small wavelength. So small lambda. You can see if I lower this um, wavelength and I maintain speed because if you'll bring back a little bit conceptual of speed, the speed of an electromagnetic wave in a vacuum is always three times 10 to the eighth uh, meters per second. Um, that's the speed of light, right? So um, an electromagnetic wave is a light wave. And um, if we're maintaining that velocity, which we are, that's constant, at least in our scenario, um, when we decrease wavelength, we're gonna have to increase frequency to kind of make up for it. So increase frequency, go back to the photoelectric effect. We're gonna increase energy. That's why we see that gamma rays and x-rays and I mean, I'm, imagine if I get blasted with a cosmic ray, I'm just gonna obliterate. Oh, you but literally would explode. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, <laughs> you with those things. Um, you know, you're gonna get cancer, you're gonna have a lot of cell damage because they're just so high energy. Whereas if you get hit with a, you know, a radio, if you ever hear that microwaves cause cancer, they're actually lower energy than regular old light from your light bulbs. So take with that what you will, I'm not a physicist, but I would think that that would mean it's probably not gonna cause cancer. So that's why you can kind of walk through a radio, the radio waves that are all around us and not get hurt. They're very low energy. Anything else to say about that, John? These are very simple questions. Yeah, no, these are cake. The only thing you got to watch for is your units. Like, got to make sure that you're converting everything to a base unit. What I mean by that is you're going to see millimeters. You need to convert it to meters. Or you're going to see nanometers. Usually you're going to see nanometers. And then your answer is going to be in meters or you'll see nanometers and your answer is in joules but you got to remember the equation for joules is in meters not nanometers so just make sure you're converting everything to your baseline units and then take these free points my goodness but if it's if it would be helpful for, for you all for us to like host a math review of some sort comment below and let us know that you're interested in that because um, we can throw that together uh, like a kind of like a MCAT how to math type of deal. Um, but yeah, just take those free points where you can get them. Yeah. And um, math does not go away in med school, by the way. My first, <laughs> my first test um, in biochemistry was on like amino acids, enzyme kinetics, pH, uh, Henderson Hasselbach, and, and, and just a ton of math goes with all that. So it doesn't go away, unfortunately. Here's to relearning Henderson Hasselbeck for the millionth time. Yeah, I got to relearn like glycolysis again. <laughs> yeah, again. All right, um, I think this is the last slide. Um, it says the solution is, um, you know, this is from the passage. This solution, let me move this thing, is introduced into a patient prior to a test that involves observing the heart at rest and during exercise on a stationary bicycle with a load of 30 watts. 99 MTC decays to 99 TC by emitting 140 kilo electrovolt gamma photons detected by a suitable camera. The resulting image of blood flow around the heart, around and through the heart, allows an accurate diagnosis of the patient's circulatory system. If you'll notice, I kind of picked this from the same 
um, passage we picked the Doppler effect thing from. So the question says, what is the frequency of the emitted gamma photons? Note use Planck's constant and it gives us Planck's constant and the oh, elementary charge. <laughs> and just remember, I would, I would hate also to miss one of these because I didn't know Planck's constant. Um, and the elementary charge of that, that's another value you need to memorize. All right, so how do we go through this? We're looking for frequency, right? Um, here we go, we're looking for frequency. I know a little bit, it's giving me Planck's constant, that's giving me like E equals HF vibes. Why did I just write an E with two little things? Okay, E equals HF. Um, so I have H, I'm looking for F, I need E, right? So how am I gonna get E? Um, I'm gonna be using something in the passage, you know, I'm not supposed to know anything about the energy of a gamma photon off the top of my head. So I'm gonna be using this 140 kilo electrovolts. Here. So 140 kilo electrovolts, I went ahead and like put that into scientific notation um, just because I do that with everything. You know, 1.4 times 10 to the fifth electron volts. Uh, you know, and I know I'm looking for the E in E equals HF. And I did, I did the double thing again. I think I'm having a stroke. <laughs> um, so, you know, we get, we're given the elementary charge as well. And so to get the energy of these electron volts as a charge, we're going to have to multiply by the, electric, by the elementary charge. So 1.4 times 10 to the 5 electron volts times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Per one electron. That's what that means. That elementary charge is the charge in one electron or in one proton for that matter. Um, you know, it'll be negative if it's an electron, but in this case, they didn't put that. So the reason that she is doing this is to convert electron volts to joules because E equals HF, the energy uh, is supposed to be in joules to go next to Planck's constant. Mm -hmm. So I get, you know, we have to do all this mental math in our head. 1.4 times 1.6, that's not an easy one to do in my head. I, I took the time to kind of like line it up over on the side and do like 14 times 16, just to fi figure out the numbers. And I got, you know, quickly doing it, I got about 2.2 um, times E to the negative 14, not times E, but times um, 10 to the negative 14. So then, um, how did, I, yeah. So that's my E. In joules in joules. So now that I have that, I can just divide both sides by the frequency, just normal algebra. Sorry, 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 sorry. Divide both sides by Planck's constant. Just normal algebra. <laughs> just a little algebra. Um, it's, I don't know letters, okay? I'm a STEM person. Um, Divide by both sides by Planck's constant and 2.2 divided by 6.6 .6, um, equals out to about like 3.3. .3. You know, that, that's about one third. Or 0.33 times 10 to the 20th. That was the easiest way that I got it. And then, uh, you know, you move your decimal place one, one over. And so you get 3.3 .3 times 10 to the 19 hertz. Now you accidentally deleted um, part of the four, 2.2 .2 e to the negative 14 is what it should say. But it's important ah. to note that like Maggie was very careful with her math. She's very good at mental math. Um, but look at all the answer choices around it. As far as the actual scientific notation goes around it, none of them are even stinking close. The mantissas yeah. are kind of similar. 
but the scientific notion notations, none of them are close. And so I, I see what I would see that before I even started doing the math. I, I literally check for that. Um, it's, it's part of like my math. I'll see if the mantises are similar and if they're not, what the scientific notation is. And I just pretty much focus on the mantissa math and vice versa. So here mantises are similar, but the scientific notations aren't. And so I was like, oh man, I'm just going to send it then. <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm going round. And so I was like, uh, 1.5 ish times 1.5 ish. Um, that's what six over four, no nine over four. And then you're pretty much just really focusing on making sure you get the, the scientific notation correct. Because if you get times 10 to the 19th, there's only one answer choice you're clicking. That's true. Uh, that's why I always ended up like marking my math answer or my math questions and coming back to them at the end. Um, it's because I'm a loser and I didn't pay attention. But usually it is like the mantissa or the, the exponent that is close. And so you just have to go with the one that's not close, you know, make it make life easier. Okay. And again, if you if you have a video you need or you want, or if math is one of those comment and we would be happy to make a video like that. Okay, Maggie, is that it? That's it. All right. Thanks for sticking around. Did you get it?